this is the man who created Mist, or one of the men, the, le the leading creative. The other guy's not here, so as far as you're concerned, it was just it me. It was just him. Um, so Rand is going to be receiving our Trailblazer Award this afternoon at our awards. Um, he has been on the list for many years, and we were very lucky to get him on shockingly short notice, finally, after all this time. And so we wanted to have a little conversation with him today about his game design trajectory, which really has this beautiful story arc of starting indie, um, going mainstream, and then going back to indie. So, um, and I have a special place in my heart for his work because I did my PhD dissertation on one of his games and the fans that uh, gathered around it, and also uh, that eventually turned into a book. So um, we're going to geek out a little bit up here. We've had very interesting conversations in the past, and now we're just doing one for an audience. So uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy it. At the end, we'll have a little time for questions. So, um, so Rand made his first game in 1988, correct? Yeah, I believe that's right. Been so, how many people had been born at that point? Oh, okay, good. So, a few people. Okay, um, <laughs> um, I want to know, at that moment in time, and kind of what was going on in the game industry and, and media in general, what crazy thing instigated you to suddenly want to make a game? Oh, I wanted to make games long before that. I, I, you know those moments in your life when you do something and it's like the light goes on. Sometimes it's buying something. Sometimes it's meeting someone. Sometimes, well, in this particular example, it was a friend taking me to the University of New Mexico Computer Center where there was bit, this big green computer screen, which, you know, I was in junior high, didn't really know what computers were. No one in junior high got to ever touch computers, whatever those were. And he sat me down in front of it and said, here, you, you can do stuff with this. And there's games. And it was like, wait, what? Games? What? Now, what, what year was this, if you don't mind my oh, asking? Oh, yeah, yeah. This would have been, um, it was way back. I'm going to, we'll, we'll have a few more hands of people who were born. when I, uh, This was 70, early 70s. I don't know what year exactly, but early 70s, we'll call it. So anyway, the, uh, I, I didn't know what computer games were. I didn't know what computers were. He brought up a game called Lunar Lander. And it's not what any of you are thinking, probably, because I don't see a lot of gray hair. But it was just a line of text that said, this is how high your ship is. This is how fast you're going. And this is how much fuel you have, question mark. And you typed in a number as quickly or as slowly as you like which is how much fuel you wanted to burn, and you hit return and rinse, repeat. It then told you how high and how fast and how much fuel you had left. And the goal was to land in one piece on the lunar surface with no graphics or anything like that. And bing, the magic light went on. Yeah, I was, this was like, I, I will do this. I want to do this. Mm. I don't know what this is. Um, but yeah, that, so it got started early. But I, I didn't know how you could do that. In fact, you couldn't at that point. There was no way I could do that. So I went into banking instead. <laughs> and so in 1988, um, what are some games you remember that were around before that and up to that point that you had played or noticed or either, either positive or negative inspiration for you? Yeah, good question. Um, so this, yeah, it got started being mesmerized by games and then, of course, wanted to own my own computer when that was even possible at some point down the line from that. Um, but there were games like, games that made an impression on me in a really exciting way were games like Zork, the text, early text adventures. It was, there were certain things that did in my brain that it just made you feel like you were somewhere else. And again, it's weird. It's just text on the screen, but <laughs> your brain starts filling in the holes and it's, gives you a feeling you may not have had before, or in my case. Um, and I remember another game on, a, on the Mac, um, in particular, it was called, I think it was called Deja Vu. It was the first, it was, it, it was like a mixture of those Zork games, because it had a still picture on, on, the, on the screen, and I, I think you woke up in a bathroom stall or something. I don't even remember the specifics, but again, it was another iteration of like, oh, wow, this makes me feel like I'm somewhere else. Um, 
doing something else. Those were, you know, obviously, I think, intrigued me. And I, there was the usual fare as well of, uh, I mean, I had an Atari and I played all the stuff. Battlezone back in the coin-op days was one that blew me away because it was 3D. Now you guys would see it and go, no, 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 that's not 3D. Those are just lines on a screen. <laughs> but it was, for the first time, felt like to me there was something not flat there that wasn't just painted in my head. So, um, And then in 88, so the, the weird transition occurred in 88 because I had a job at a bank, uh, which was a gravy job. Uh, many times in the game industry, I wonder why I quit that gravy job. Um, <laughs> Nice pay and short hours and bonuses. Um, and you were programming, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I also had just had a daughter in addition to you know, getting into computers, and I wanted some really nice software for her. It was like, there should be really cool. You know, yeah, you get a children's book. And a children's book, yeah, they call it a children's book, but if it's a good children's book, adults are like, oh, this is a cool, I, wanna re I will read this one to a kid because it's cool for me too. Well, I thought there should be the same kind of software for kids and was shocked that for the most part in that time frame or a little before that, it seemed like if you couldn't write software that was entertaining for adults, you just kind of would slough something off and sell it as kids' software. Um, so my brother, who was into art, um, I wrote him a letter and said, we should do this, some kind of book for kids that was interactive and really cool. And uh, he said, no. And so I said again, no, we should, we should do this. Um, and I'm, I'm making a short story long, sorry, but the cool stuff, and I've told this story before, was he, he drew like the first page of what we thought at that point was going to be a book. And it was kind of inventing itself as we went. But in the book had a picture of a manhole on the street and a fire hydrant in the background. Well, the cool thing, and I think the, the most amazing thing that happened in, in all of our development was that we never turned the page. We never really went to a new page because it was so intriguing to wonder, well, what happens if I open that manhole cover and a vine grows out? And well, what's up the vine and what's down the manhole cover? And, and what had started as a page in a book became a world. It became something that you, you could go deeper this way instead of along the edges of. Mm -hmm. And I think that was kind of what set us up for what we would do as a company from then on. And I'm just curious also, in addition to games, was there anything outside of games? I'm always interested in knowing what movies uh, de developers are watching, what books they're reading. I found out from talking to uh, to Will Wright that a lot of his games are inspired by books. So I was curious if there was anything else outside of games that influenced you. Definitely, yeah. I, you know, the crazy thing about inspiration is I, I think sometimes it's hard to pinpoint it. You know, you come up with an idea and you're not exactly sure where it came from. It's something from your past. And I, inevitably, I think everything's kind of based on something else. So it's a good question. I think if I had to, if I had to point at specific things, um, d and D was a really interesting, uh, inspirational um, activity. My brother DM'd, and he was into it really big time with dice and, and the books and all the, the standard fare. And I kind of liked that. My character was Sir Hewlett of Packard, by the way. I <laughs> little known fact. Uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever told anybody that. Uh, yeah. You heard it here at <laughs> That's Indiegate. That's right. Um, yeah, let's talk about geeking out. Man, oh man. Um, anyway, I, I was so intrigued with, again, this place building aspect of it. I mean, he was explaining things and there was some kind of a top down map, but again, it felt like we were going on an adventure and I was inspired to make my own. And um, this was a, another one of those pivotal, weird moments where, well, I'm just going to do a top-down map of this place and I'm going to speak it to these people because I was going to DM my own game and I don't really need the dice because I'm just going to take what they do and design puzzles around it and they'll have to figure stuff out. And it was a, a very different than than D&D, &D, it, but it was the seed of of how we design games to this day. When we sat down to do abduction, it was based on that 
on that exactly what we did and have been doing since day one, which is this top-down map of you're here, and we go here and here and put some friction in, and the story kind of evolves. And yeah, so that was one big aspect. I think um, Lord of the Rings was another big one, both positive and you're negative. You're talking about the book. Yeah, the book. Sorry, yeah. Not the early movies that came out, which were kind of bizarre. But anyway, um, yeah. But Lord of the Rings, in both a good and bad way, um, the books are incredible. And the stories are amazing. There is so much history that, uh, you know, I admit to you, I did some fast page turning on occasion in the books. There, I mean... Tolkien just, he goes crazy with a lot of filling in the blanks because in his mind it was a real place. And that's inspirational, inspirational to me, but it was, it was also, well, sometimes there can be a little much that doesn't appeal to everybody. So you have to kind of parse it out and different people will get entertained in different ways. But the fact that he had done so much work behind the scenes for what was, you know, this great little story that he wrote was another thing that's like, oh, wow. That, that's kind of cool. Another one is, um, yeah, I think this, you know, for people my age, probably a lot, it was Star Wars, the first Star Wars movie. Sitting, sitting down at the beginning of that one and having, not the, if you go back and watch it, and it's not that epic, but the fact that we started not at the beginning <laughs> seemed really cool to me. Like, wait, um, this was episode four. Wait, 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 wait. Did I miss something? And it came out of the blue. I mean, I, I didn't know what Star Wars was. I didn't have any, I wasn't reading about it. I just went to the theater, and this crawl goes up saying it's episode four. Like, wait. But it kind of filled in the blanks. But the story seemed fresh in both directions, which is a really, uh, I don't know, it's a special moment, I think, in entertainment, when you can get it, get it going both directions, where something catches you where it's going to be intriguing that way, and you don't know what happened that way. Um, anyway, there's a few examples. Cool. You know, when you mentioned Tolkien, I think it's really interesting because his process really began with creating the world. Like, he also started with the map. Um, the storytelling actually came out of the world creation. Wow. So he started with the map and the language and the, and the belief systems and all that and the races, and then he told a story around this world he created. So in a, a funny way, he's kind of a nascent game designer. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. I did not realize that. And I, I mean, for me, this is particularly salient because as a game design teacher, in fact, next semester, I'm going to be teaching Designing Imaginary Worlds. And guess what game they're going to have to play? Um, <laughs> because I think this is a skill that we don't, we kind of undervalue and we don't really teach. Like you learn how to tell stories, but you don't really learn how to make worlds. People, right. I think they teach that here, actually, but most places don't teach it. So it's, it's a definitely important skill. No, it, well, and if I can add a oh, little, yeah, it's, absolutely. it's kind of interesting because it's, you hear a lot about story, putting story in your game design, and you hear a lot about friction, of course. It's, you know, game, the, design, the game mechanics and the thing that slows you down, whether it's bad guys or, or uh, actual friction in the case of a racing car game tires, I guess. Uh, um, but it is. I, I, I don't know what the skill set and the tools are necessary for doing a world, and it is... Those are things that are really amazing to me. They kind of grow out of and evolve out of nothingness. I guess story is the same thing, but it just feels like this place is coming from somewhere else. And it's kind of magical because as uh, every time, as I've built the place, it feels like I'm explore, exploring the place. Right. It's so just I, coming out as you're... Yeah. I get to be it. the first one who explores it in some ways, which is... I think appropriate. I, I mean, it's almost like the, the space is a character. And in your games in particular, at least in specifically in the Mist games and particularly in Uru, the uh, person who made the space you're in drives the personality of the space. So you, you go, oh, so-and-so made this. And so these puzzles are based on some idea that this person cared about. It's very interesting. Yeah, it gets complicated fast. Yeah. So, um, so you've done, now you've done a manhole. And you've mailed the little five-inch floppy disks, right? Oh, yeah. Out in the mail by mail order. I don't know if you people know. We used to put stamps on things, and then someone would take them out of a box and take them somewhere else. And um, no internet at this point, right? 
No. Um, and how did that, I mean, how did that go? <laughs> it went, that went like better than I thought, although not from a business point of view, because from a business point, point of view, I don't, I still don't think I get that part of things really <laughs> well. Um, but my brother and I worked a long hours of, of our, and we, you know, I kept my job and, but off time was working on this side thing, the manhole. And I don't know how many hours you don't keep track of stuff like that, but we took it to a, some little show that I don't, I can't remember what I think it was related to HyperCard, which was the platform it was designed in. And a publisher came up to us and offered us $20,000. Oh my gosh. I mean, you just, people don't offer you $20,000. Now, it was funny because it was months later, I started doing the math of how many hours we had actually spent. And, you know, it wasn't even minimum wage that we were getting. But in one lump sum, $20,000, that is huge. That is incredible. And we were kind of on our way. It was because once you start getting in the thousands, it feels like it's, you know, well, that's kind of real money. That's more than a couple of And it's of 1988, so it's yeah. like eight times more than it is yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> and now I still didn't quit my job because, you know, couldn't do that with 20000 yet and splitting it two ways. Um, but we could then kind of bootstrap with that money the next one. And we didn't know Did you Did you guys get any royalties or was it just a flat? No, no, we got royalties too. It was the, the wonderful deal it gets you. I think we probably got 8% at that point, you know, which is how the publishers work. Uh, we can talk about that. <laughs> That's why I'm back in indie. Um, but... It did, and again, we weren't good businessmen, so you're supposed to use other people's money. We didn't realize that. We just thought, <laughs> okay, well, let's take the money they gave us and make another game. Cool, because we can now. So we did, and we kind of spent our own money on it. Yeah, which ended up being Cosmo Cosmo, yeah. which was... So you made, how many games did you make before Mist altogether? Uh, we made uh, three, it was... We'll just call it three main kids games before we got an opportunity for Mist, And I call it an opportunity because um, we had always thought that we were getting better at this, building worlds. If you go back and look at Manhole now, it's very rudimentary. But we got to experiment and still got paid a little for it, I think, is, is a good way to look at it. Osmo, Cosmic Osmo was really good. It's, it's still, I still really like that game. We haven't done much with it because we kind of just hold it dear to our Are there hearts. any emulators if we wanted to play any of these games? Or can people find some? I'm not sure. These might be on Steam even. Uh, it's possible in some form or, or, or fashion. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so Osmo came around and we really started building worlds that felt like we were putting some story in them, but still insane and weird. Spelunks was the same thing. It actually had a book on a shelf that gave some of the backstory of this Spelunks idea, which was another kid's game. But I think we always were holding out that, okay, there ought to be, we ought to make the move at some point for this kind of thing for an older audience. Um, you know, something that would challenge, we have a deeper story and challenge adults in a way that you can't do with a kid's game. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what led to Miss. We actually had an idea for one earlier and took it to a few people and presented it and they were like, no, nah, I, I don't really get this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and even Mist we took to some people and they were like, and, and again, we, um, it wasn't done in, in the normal channels. A Japanese company called us out of the blue and said, we love your kids' games, could you do something for an older audience? It was just not even pitching, not, they just saw the same thing we did, I think, in our evolution and said, we like what you're doing, could you do this for an older audience? And we said, yeah, you bet. Here's, and they said, could you give us a proposal? And we didn't know what proposals were for games, so we drew maps. It was a map of all the worlds of mist with little lines and what stuff was, and they kept saying, okay, uh, this is gonna be good, right? And we were like, yep. Everybody's going to buy this, or maybe, I think, yeah. And, <laughs> and part of it believe, we believed, because I think, and I've used this word a lot recently, we were very naive. And that's not always a bad thing. It, <laughs> sometimes that can let, allow you to try things that otherwise you never in a million years would try. And 
we were naive. We thought we would do okay all along this path. And some, there were a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And even though it seems, you know, like Mist was this overnight thing, we had Cosmic Osmo was our favorite. It was incredible. It was awesome. And as soon as it went on sale, the publisher stopped, never sent us any royalty checks. We never saw royalties from Cosmic Osmo. And we kind of talked to him on the phone and said, hey, we're just a couple guys and uh, you should send us our money. And they're like, oh, gosh, yeah, we're having trouble. And we said, well, just give us the rights back then. You don't even have to give us, just give us the rights to our stuff back because we love it. And they're like, no, we'll go to court. It's like, what? How does this work? And anyway, so it wasn't all roses. There was lots of failures, and, but we just kept going. We just kept turning, turning over and doing the next thing. And I, you know, I could give you all the ups and downs, but it eventually led to the opportunity to do Mist, which was that thing for an older audience. And it was exciting. And we did it the same way we always did. We sat down and drew those maps and sent it off, and they gave us a lot of money at the time to do that. It was not as much... That it Can you wasn't, tell us how much? Yeah, it was, okay, so we figured the budget. We, need, we, we knew we'd need a couple more people and we'd need some good computers. Yeah. And uh, so we figured this budget would take a couple years and we doubled it because we figured we were wrong. And in my mind, but it's probably being lost to time, I, we probably doubled it again and I think we asked him for like $280,000. Yeah. I just want to jump in here because $280,000 was a very large budget for a game in 1993. Today it seems like, what? But that was actually, most, most people from publishers would get $100,000 at that point. Yeah, yeah, that was a, a good amount of money. Um, they, they did it. They said, okay. And they actually said, that's too much at first. I, remember, I just remembered this. It was they tried to negotiate, and Robin and I were like, oh, well, you know, we built a little in there, but I think we're going to need every bit of that. We're making a pretty, it's going to be, feel big and, you know, all those things you say. And they said, they finally said, okay, all right. Well, the long story short, it ended up costing twice that amount. And we funded the other half ourselves because we didn't know you could go back to them and ask them for more, uh, which, again, we're not real good at this. So <laughs> we ended up selling Osmo to be bundled because we did get the rights back and that money poured right into mist and we paid for the other half ourselves. So anyway, it's a long and crazy story that you guys should just go into banking. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But we got the chance to do our overnight success of the mist, uh, mist game. Yeah. Whatever. Eight years later or something. Yeah, right. Um, so mist. Um, so what happened? What, uh, what did you learn from that experience? Not, I, I'm wondering more in terms of the audience. Like, so you make Mist, it gets published, and all of a sudden you've gone from making these little popular kids games to like making more or less of a blockbuster, right? Yeah. The, okay. Remember this now. This gives me credit. It's the best-selling game of the last millennium. They can't take that away. <laughs> exactly. Uh it's, it's, it's very weird, first of all, because, you know, we live normal lives, still do, but going and then seeing your work and seeing people write about your work is a really weird thing. It's like this duality of something. Like, it's normal life here, and it, I still remember, I still remember shipping mist, going on vacation, because it was a lot of work, um... I went to New Mexico, went to Albuquerque, New Mexico. I walked into, you know, one of those big stores that used to sell software, shelves of it, you know, and there's rows of mist on the shelf. And it's like, this isn't even, I'm not even from Albuquerque. You know, I'm from Spokane, Washington, and they have my game here. This is weird. It was, a, I mean, it's a heady, crazy, weird thing to see. That happened. It's, it's, and it's, it was, uh, uh, the other thing that's cool is when people like your game, which is cool. And some people like Miss, some people don't. Um, you will not please everyone. Um, but it was really interesting when people did get what you were trying to do. You know, where, where they, f you make your game and people write an article and say, oh, this was cool, I kind of get this. It made me feel like I was in another place. And I turned down the lights and I turned up the speakers 
and it was me and the monitor, and I just kind of forgot where I was at. And we were like, yeah, that, that is, oh, yes, you're our friend, you should play this game, because that's what we were going for. And that's more very heady, satisfying stuff that, you guys should go for that, but don't expect everybody to have that because there's also the people who were like, this is shit. Why would anybody play this? I don't want this. It sucks. Okay, thanks. Love the, you the too. The high level of game discourse. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So <laughs> anyway, you have to be prepared for that, but you, have, you live on the people who get, your, get what you're trying to say, and it's, so, it's, it's very satisfying, yeah. So one thing that struck me, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, we could talk about this for an hour, but so Mist came out the same year as Doom. Yes. And um, I love Doom in terms of its innovation, and, but, I, but I also feel like there, that we, we met a fork in the road at that point because it was sort of between the first-person shooter Twitch and the high production value, beautiful narrative, which was what you really set the high watermark for with Mist, which was technically an adventure game, but it isn't even like any other adventure game that I've ever played. And then th th that sort of split happened, and I feel like, um, you know, the, the, the Twitch bit kind of won, <laughs> right? No, I agree, yeah. Um, in spite of the fact that people kept buying Mist. And the, and the other thing about that time that struck me as really interesting, and I'm going to mention this in the awards later, but I heard about Mist from women almost exclusively mm. in 1993, my girlfriends, were, many of whom were game designers, were saying, oh my God, if you play this game, miss. And th this had never happened to me before where it was all coming from women. And so I'm wondering just from an audience perspective, and you know, sometimes business people, right, they'll come up to us and go, what's the audience for your game? Well, most of us don't think that far ahead or we think very abstractly about that. But, but were there any surprises or anything that made you particularly happy about who who was both playing and enjoying and also writing about your game, but particularly playing. We were evolving what kind of our very simple, kind world that started as a game for my daughter to something more sophisticated without trying to target some demographic of, you know, 22-year-old male. Um, it, it just felt like we were building a place. I think the other thing that was... It was really radical and bizarre, and I remember the conversation was my brother and I, you know, we're trying to think of friction. And up to this point, kids' games, there wasn't friction. You just explored freely and went around from world to world, and there wasn't anything that stopped you, that slowed you down. So it's like, well, we've got to have friction. Our, um, but you know what? We should totally do this where you don't die. You don't ever die and start over. Because we both hated that. We both, it just felt like that was when we just stopped playing a game. If I'm going to die and start over, it's like, ah, uh, that was when it was like, uh, I'll do something else. Um, but that's amazing because that's, I mean, it sounds silly that that's a radical idea, but it was and still is a radical idea. No, it, it, and it was difficult because we suddenly had the problem of, well, how, how what will we do? Because people will be done with our game in 10 minutes then because there, there's nothing to slow them down. And so we... We, we came to two brilliant conclusions that are going to sound so ridiculous. Uh, one was, we'd be like, well, we'll make it big. We'll just make a lot of space, first of all. So it'll, we'll, it'll take them at least more than 10 minutes uh, to see it all. And then, what if we just put some puzzles in? You know, like things that feel like they're supposed to be there, but there's a door that's locked or something like that. And we thought that that would fit, like, really well. And... If you look at Mist Island, those of you who have ever, if you go back and play Mist or, or look at it, you'll realize that we got better as it, at it as we went as well at that friction. This is a long story ar uh, around, but I think the fact that it, that it didn't, that you, you didn't ever feel like you were starting over, that had made it appeal maybe to a broader audience. The people were busy, um, and I think... <laughs> Women are as busy as men, or busier, um, especially back at that time. Um, and I, 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 I mean, I, I don't know what to put my finger on, but it's just, starting over just discouraged people who, go, who have busy lives to live. And I think there was something about it that a, appealed to it. The other part was, mist would come with you a bit. So you could play it, and then play it for a few hours, and then just stop. And it was something you'd think about while you weren't playing. And suddenly something would hit you like, oh my gosh. 
I think I got an idea. I'm going to go try that, and it might work. And I, so it was this really general appeal, not because of any brilliance on our part, just because we were trying to do things that appealed generally to us, but weren't necessarily part of a gaming uh, formula. And if I can say this about Doom as well, I thought so many, so much about Mist and Doom came out at the same time. We had a, I did a, a great. Uh, discussion with uh, John Romero at NYU in New York um, on the 20th anniversary. Um, the poster was like the best thing. It was like Mist Island with like red demons or something like that. You know, it was like <laughs> on Mars. It was, a, it was really awesome. But it does... It, we thought that after Mist, a lot of people would make these games. In fact, one of the, one of the things we were really excited about was like after Mist, uh, my brother and I thought cool, we'll get to play one of these because we, we didn't get to play our own games. We don't know it. And there were a few, but not a lot. And there were many more. Uh, Doom just led to tons of games like that. And I, I think some of it is, and don't take this wrong, I'm not trying to do this in an egotistical way, but making games like Myst is hard because it's not a repeatable gameplay mechanism. I don't have... A weapon, a bad guy, and an achievement structure that I just have to kind of flesh out and build some cool space to and maybe put a little story on and, and then balance it well so it feels good. I am not diminishing that anyway. It's kind of cool. I like that. It's fun. We all get that. But Miss, I can't just take the same gameplay things that I built for Mist and go, oh, cool, I'm going to use those same puzzles and I'm just going to skin those a little bit different, wrap a different story around them, and we'll call it Miss 2 or Riven or, you know, whatever. You have to think from the ground up of how these things, how these things tie together. And when we started on, on abduction, we realized, again, just how difficult this is. And I think it's, it, it is not an easy task for people to take on. I encourage any of you to do it, though. It is very satisfying when you can wrap those things together. When I go in abduction now, after putting it together, in fact, all the games, but abduction is, is on my mind, it's, it's really satisfying, and I, we have that same feeling when people go through it and see the little touches we put in that tie this puzzle to this part of the story and that part of the environment and wrap those things together. But it is very hard. Yeah. yeah. And so I... I in the interest of time, I'm going to leapfrog a little bit here, although I have to say that puzzle-wise, I think that Riven actually has the best, uh, at least uh, from Mist to Riven, you can see the evolution of the puzzle and the story integration skill. And also, you begin to interact with the language and with the culture of the, of the Denny people and a bunch of other interesting things that kind of make the story and the puzzles more, much more rich. Yes, yeah, absolutely. We got better and better at, at, at what we were doing. I mean, we were kind of honing our craft. And I'm not, I don't know that we've, you know, we haven't reached some kind of pinnacle, that's for sure, but we, we can draw on what we've done in the past and, and hopefully learn from it, both successes and failures. And Riven definitely took a big leap. Part, was, part of it was because um, we, we did learn a lot doing Mist. And the other part was Mist made us... Uh, blank ton of money that we could actually spend as much time as we wanted making ribbon. And we still hadn't learned that you weren't supposed to use your own money. So we just poured it all in there. Um, but no, that it, 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 it gave, it was a luxury to ribbon to being able to really spend immense amount of time, time yeah. designing it and, and pouring it into that game. Yeah. So then after how many more single player games were there in the, in the, in that world? Ah, there was a lot like that five or six don't need to, talk about they okay. just you know they and just kind of continue so on, so the next know. sort of leap and and i'm kind of going sort of from you know from the trailblazer perspective from yeah. sort of moment to moment of the next sort of innovation leap so at some point you went hey wouldn't it be cool if people could be in this world together so why and you know because as someone who's also worked on multiplayer games it's kind of it takes that hard thing you're talking about and makes it an order of magnitude harder. So what made you even want to do that in the first place? Naivety. Uh, <laughs> did I mention that? Uh, it was actually after Riven. After Riven, there were no plans to do any more missed sequels. I was, 
I, I was like, well, the next thing, the next logical thing is let's take how this worked with Riven. What was amazing and what people waited for Riven was because it was new places to explore. People wanted new places. Let's take me to a new spot now. And what we found ironically was even though these were called single player games, almost everyone we talked to played with someone else. They discussed it with someone or they sat in front of the monitor with someone. That's how my like, nephews played it. Yeah, yeah. And we found that time after time. It was a shared experience, either long distance or short distance. But so we took those two very simple things and said, look, this thing, the internet is getting faster and faster and broadband internet was on the horizon and people were getting wired with fast pipelines. And instead of evolving that, into a massively, a massively uh, multiplayer online game that was about achievement, and you know, it, we we didn't do the Doom uh, fork. We did the Mist fork of what would that be if if you had a, a really fast pipeline. And to me, it was content. It was people want new stuff. I don't I don't want them to have this to be driven just by achievement and and uh, treadmilling. I would love it if. Honestly, they, they subscribed to this, and every day when they came back, something new was there. And every week when they come back, something bigger was there. And every month, corresponding probably with their payment, uh, a brand new world was there so that they wouldn't want to leave. And that just seemed like a really exciting thing. It also didn't seem incredibly exciting to me to explore with millions of other players, it, but it did seem cool to be able to pick and choose who you wanted to explore with. And so those were like cornerstones of what we were trying to build make people blow people away with the new stuff all the time and um and that other thing i just said <laughs> sorry um new new uh new content and you shared a shared, shared experience. experience yeah and yeah, so you have other people there that's really fascinating because i remember noticing that about mist and i and i didn't realize that that emergent behavioral phenomenon was one of the things that inspired you to create a networked multiplayer game. That's super cool. And so uh, I remember actually hearing you at GDC talking about Uru a couple of years before it came out, and I was so excited. And um, so uh, for people who don't know, Uru came out in 2003, and it was in a beta for six months, and then the publisher pulled the plug on it after spending quite a bit of money, right? Mm -hmm. um, not as much as us. Yeah. Again, we, mm, we I, forgot how I that did works. You, oh, well, and you know what? We'll talk about that in a minute because Kickstarter. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, what I'm interested in is, first of all, what, and we don't have a huge amount of time left, but I'd love you to just talk a little bit about what happened with Uru that surprised you. I am, so Uru is one of those weird things that it's a giant failure, I mean, we spent a lot of money on Uru. It was amazing. We pulled it off. I think in the end we had you know, 40,000 people in the beta ready to go live. And the publisher said, nah, let's not do that. In spite of all of that, it, it seemed to work. And the thing that was most exciting, we, we, there was a lot of sad stuff about what happened to Uru, but <laughs> <laughs> that I, you know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote a whole book about it. But <laughs> the tears we, and the yeah, gnashing of teeth. We did get a chance to try some of the theories. It was resurrected. And, um, and it, even though a lot of the content, we, we had content planned out over a year in advance. So we had built the studio large enough and had designed content so that we could dole out those worlds every month and do smaller things. And it was, it was a weird thing. It was live. The whole thing was live so that there were there were characters in the game that would play out parts and you were never sure who was a character and who wasn't a character and, and people would tell stories about what happened last night when they were in Uru in the cavern and it would spread throughout and then people would want to be there the next day just in case and weird things played out but one of the larger stories that we wanted to try just to see um, was involved a, a young girl named Wheelie who had been in the game for years. She was in during the entire beta period. And I, the beta, I think we started the beta like in a, ye a year. We had a long beta. And she was there. People weren't sure whether she was um, part of the game or not part of the game, you know, actor or not. An she was actor. a non-player character or a player character. Yeah, Even exactly. though she was run by a real person. Right, right. But she was run by an actor on our side. And 
we had built that up as a storyline for a long time. And then we, we wanted to see what would happen. And we had this as part of the story for a long time. When there was a, a dramatic, uh, um, like a, a, a dramatic collapse of the cavern she was in and she was pinned under some rock and it was just, it was amazing. I mean, there was like a vigil and people are there, so they're coming to the city. The city is the big bad place where you don't have to go, but it's just like real life. Normally people can be in their neighborhoods or in their own little private homes and do whatever they want to do. But in the city, you know, you might run across weirdos like you do in a city. So, but in that particular case, everybody came to the city and it was, it was weird. They're all talking and, and, and Wheelie ended up dying. And it was a really kind of emotional moment which, if nothing else, it was a proof of concept that I think this thing can work. It was, it was a narrative that was being played out in real time with real people and blur, blurring those lines again between what you could do with, with interactive and keeping them a little blurry. Like, what was, what was story? And what part of the story am I compared to that person? And maybe I am kind of part of the story, and sometimes you would become part of the story. It was, it was a very strange thing. Anyway, that was one of the high points because I feel like in some ways it vindicated everything we were trying to do and we never got a chance to you know, pump all that content back in because it got uh, raped and pillaged to do other things with. But um, it, was, it was, I'm still convinced that somebody sometime will, will bring that back up mm -hmm. and, and make something of that. And... I mean, you know I mean, they kind so of much about all that. Players you know. did, right? So, yeah, um, yeah so w after we closed, uh, many of the players went to other virtual worlds and started making their own Uru-inspired assets, and they would call themselves Uru refugees. And multiple times, they pushed the game to reopen. Um, I won't, I won't re-traumatize you with the whole narrative of that, but um, I want to, again, skip ahead. So um, after a few years of this amazing fan group who... In a way, I think supercharged, you, you already had a huge fan base, but it seemed like it, this game made that a lot more intimate. So then now, in 2013, you decide, hey, you know what? There's this new way that we can make games with other people's money called crowdsourcing. And um, we have these fans, and we want to make another single-player game. So my question to you is, what did, how did Uru change things for you? I mean, obviously Kickstarter did as well, but how was, what, were, what, what about abduction was different from your prior games because of that experience of having a multiplayer game? Wow, okay, I could, it's a good question. I could go into a lot of stuff. Abduction used every bit of our money. Um, okay. So we had to, and, and we'd been through cycles like this. But definitely after abduction, we were very low. And we're, we've always just been a studio in Spokane, Washington, kind of in the middle of nowhere, and been fairly independent. We sold things to publishers mostly, given them most of the money. And Uru kind of took the wind out of our sails, not just because, you know, in, in many people's eyes it failed, but because it also took so much of the content that we had planned out so far in ahead and it just, it was gone. It was all gone. So people gradually left and we kind of had a bare bones crew that we, uh, the mobile market was coming just at the right time to, that we could weirdly, and again, the gray hair says it all, but wait, I can play Mist on a phone? Are you kidding me? Because when Mist came out, it was, it, it, I mean, it needed the, the best yeah. multimedia computer. Even with still get. images, it taxed the hell out of a computer yeah. in 1993. Right. So on a phone, it was bizarre, but it kept us alive. We were able to, you know, you can call it milking Mist, but it was very satisfying to kind of put it on a small screen and have it in the palm of your hand in some ways, too. And it kept us going little by little. Um, we kept our eye on the Kickstarter thing as a, wow, this might be kind of cool. But we knew it wouldn't be a huge thing. We weren't going back to the Uru thing. This was going to be small, something that drew on the, on the roots of that original mist. And we all felt like that. It was a group of people, both ex-employees and current employees, who were all kind of starting to stir that 
Kickstarter pod. Mm -hmm. And we, we would get together on a weekly basis at my house and talk about what it would be. And I think we all thought it would be Mist because, oh, everybody will be on, buy a Mist thing. You know, that, Mist will sell it. We'll just do another Mist thing. And I remember going home over, over a weekend and thinking about what that Mist thing would be and realizing I just didn't have it in me. There was, it's, and it's not, I have to explain it this way. Your home is a good thing. I love my home. It's nice. It's cozy. But every now and then, you got to get out of your home. You've got to get somewhere else. And it does make you appreciate your home when you come back. But you need a vacation. And, it, that, and that weekend, I decided, I need a vacation. I've got to get out of this. And the idea of a blank slate, of starting this design and drawing a map, again, on a clean piece of paper with nothing that way and nothing that way, it's a nice segue there. Um, just, boom, energy. My energy level went up, and I knew immediately, I was like, okay, that's what we have to do. And I went back and told the guys, and they all went, yep, boom, let's do it. And abduction was a, an idea we'd had at Cyan for a lot of years, and we decided to approach it in a completely new way and, and you know, just use it as a seed of an idea, but it was invigorating. And um, there was a weird discussions about what it would be but ultimately, in some ways, it, it, it was the very thing that missed was. And I think we didn't realize, um, after all those years, that we had lost that, that very first, you know, this way, this way thing, where we were plopped down in the middle of something and didn't, and you didn't know why you were here. You know, the, the, there wasn't a big cinematic, like uh, Miss yeah. didn't have that either. There was nothing that explained anything. Yeah, I noticed both, both Uru and, and Abduction, you start basically in a cave. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just, you're, you're, there's, and there's, there's some nice psychology to all that, but it's, you are, um, you get to have that same feeling of, I don't know what came before this. I don't know what lies ahead. And it's up to you to kind of become part of that storyline. And I think it's a, it's a magical moment. I, the interesting thing about that is after abduction was done, it was so fun and so reinvigorating to give people that feeling. I was like, I, I don't want to do an abduction too. We, mm -hmm. we went so naturally from mist to ribbon that, it, you know, people were asking as we were designing, well, are you, you going to do abduction too? It's like, no, it's really cool to give that that fresh experience to people, that one that starts over and gives them something really fresh and clean and new. Um, I, sh I mean, I should say, too, abduction definitely called on those feelings of mist. It, there's some little, you know, nods, and, and, uh, and we wanted it to not, not completely go crazy breaking new ground. We wanted it to feel kind of like you were playing mist in some ways and did that. And we don't, we won't, not going to do that again. But it, it, it was perfect for what it, what it was. And the Kickstarter thing is like, who, who decides that the, oh, just ask the internet for money and they'll give it to you. I mean, what a crazy thing. How much so, did you guys make for the Kickstarter? I mean, it was close to your ask, right? Oh, yeah. It was, it was a little over the ask. And uh, another story, and by the way, this is, I mean, it's, it's uh, again, one of those weird things. But we ended up needing about double and we found more money. You know, we could get it ourselves. Um, but it's, it's, it's very invigorating. You guys live in amazing, amazing times because it feels like when we started Mist, and this is how you kind of let off. The whole thing comes full circle. I'm probably jumping the gun here yeah, on something. but um, Right on target. <laughs> okay. Um, we did Mist, and it just felt like, you know, we, we could put uh, those kids' games, felt like we could pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. It was just my brother and I, doing some stuff and using the technology we had and putting it out there for people to play. It, granted, it wasn't the same way you have at your fingertips, but then for a long time, you couldn't do that. I mean, it was, publishers just, you had no money. It, it, your small games wouldn't do anything. You had no way to distribute them. There was no way to be creative because it had to fit a cookie cutter. And we felt the same thing. We, we would take what we thought were really cool proposals to publishers and they'd be like, no, not really. Yeah, because the adventure game genre is dead, as yes, you know. Yes, completely dead, yeah. Um, so the long tail is what makes this all possible for you guys, and it's so invigorating. I'm so happy 
that it's available. But, you know, you don't have to please the big thing. You guys can dribble off the, to the long tail and please people who are like-minded. Make incredibly cool things that, you, that people will find you and, and play your games or have the experiences you can, you can offer them. So it's, it's the two things. It's Kickstarter and crowdfunding. It's, well, it's other things besides that. It's that. It's the, it's the fact that you can distribute this stuff just instantly all over the world. And, of course, the third thing is the technology that you know, makes that all possible. It, it is much more interesting now, I think, than it's ever been. So, yeah, it, it, the days we're in now are, I'm so, like, pumped. I, I, you know, if somebody would have asked me 10 years ago or, or how I felt about all this, I'd have been like, I just, I'm just tired. I'm tired. I've been through all this. I worked really hard at what I thought was, like, the ultimate project I wanted to do and the whole thing collapsed and it's, it's hard, but I feel like inspired again. I, I, honestly, it feels fresh. And it's by the fact that I have gray hair. I, I do feel like, like you put it, like I'm, I'm mid career. Thank you very, that was very kind of you, not end career. And hopefully the lessons I've learned will help me as I go forward but they might tie me in little ways, too, that they won't tie you guys. You guys are starting with fresh minds and doing amazing things that I think offer whole new glimpses into all new forms of entertainment. Anyway, it's a good time to be doing this.